just made it. What's up, everybody? I'm Andy Alessio, and welcome to the latest edition of the Back to Back Hip Hop Podcast. On Skype with me is my boy, New Jersey artist Shinigami. So, how you doing, man? Hey, what's good, bro? I'm chilling. How are you, dude? I'm just glad that we're fucking re-recording this because the first one was so good. Check my laptop <laughs> and look at it after, and like you can't hear a fuck of a word I say. So this is perfect that we're back at it. All right, I'm gonna be honest with you. I was like. During that, when we were recording that, I was pretty slumped and like I was kind of stuck in my room. But now I'm outside. It's a beautiful day. I'm walking through the trees and I feel much more relaxed. Dude, let's get it, man. So first and foremost, I love looking at artists' Twitter bios because what they read says a lot about you. Yours says, may your heart be your guiding key. So what life experiences really led you to realize the importance of having your heart serve as your guide besides playing Kingdom Hearts? <laughs> well... I would have to say, like, my music career as a whole, because I've basically only relied on my heart to guide me through it, you know, this whole time, because my mind is a little bit unstable. I, I kind of, you know, go back and forth. I'm, I'm anxious. I overthink things a lot. But at the end of the day, I just go with what I feel. And I feel like a lot more people should try to do that. It's obvious, man, that your primary influence is pop punk. And you obviously followed your heart in staying true to your pop punk influences while at the same time being able to combine that style of genre with other musical styles. Yeah, exactly, because the music that I really love, I listened to like Biggie and shit when I was little because of my parents, like they were big on hip hop. So I kind of grew up on hip hop because of that. But as I got older, I didn't listen to it that much. The only like rapper I really fucked with when I was younger was Lil Wayne. So I feel like he definitely had an influence on me as well as like obviously Blink and all those other bands and stuff like that. So I kind of just realized like what what my true interests are like as a person. And I was like, this is what I need to do. I need to combine this in some way. And that's that's what I did. How long have you been in this? Since what, 2012? <sighs> yeah. So, I mean, do you finally feel that you're at the point now almost over five years later where you finally, I mean, found the sound that you want? Oh, definitely. Like, I feel like I'm always going to change. Like, I'm I, I'm not scared to change or evolve or anything like that. Like, I already saw comments. Like, I posted that song, like, literally, like, maybe 20 minutes ago. And somebody DM'd me. And it was, like, a fan that I was talking to before. They were like, you know, like, you know, what would, what would your advice be for making my first song? You inspire me a lot. Like, you know, and I was, you know, I was talking to them and trying to help them out. And then I dropped the song. And they DM'd me. And they're like, how can you go from making a rap to rock? I don't fuck with this. And I was just like, what? Like, you say you're a big fan of me, but like, I literally released probably five, maybe uh, like full band songs, whether it be like, you know, the hardcore, post hardcore kind of shit or the pop punk shit. And it like really like, I was dumbfounded. I was like, like you said that like, oh, you're this big fan, but like, you've never heard my rock shit. So it doesn't make sense. So they obviously, that doesn't make sense at all. They obviously don't realize that you are the second coming of pop punk gods because obviously so many people tell you that you are the person to carry the pop punk gods voices to the next generation. You already know that that tweet literally made my entire life. I, I was that, that tweet saved my life. I'm not going to lie. I was feeling like real shit that day. And when uh, I saw that tweet, I was like, damn, I was like, I need to keep on keeping on. No more bitching. Just got to make more pop punk. <laughs> Dude, that's really what it comes down to is pop punk in general, man. That's all life should be. Of course, like bands like Neck Deep and Blank, Knuckle Puck, Story So Far, like they have, they've had such a positive influence on my life. Because I, I feel as though, obviously, like what you listen to and who you look up to, they definitely affect you as a person. Like a lot of people are like, oh, you know, you can't, you can't expect artists, you know, to be good influencers or whatever. But 
it, it's definitely something that should be kept in mind as an artist. And I noticed that like a lot of pop punk bands, they were, you know, looking at the world in a brighter way. And that's something that I needed in my life. And that's uh, like something that I want to do for other people is like offer some hope and some, you know, silence from all the noise of the world. I don't think people really realize, too, that one, the artists that you listen to not only influence who you are as an artist, but more importantly as a person, because I know that was Blink and, I mean, the sad boys who really gave you the confidence to more importantly just be an individual. Oh, yeah, of course. Like, when I first came across Young Lean, that was my introduction to the underground. That was, he was the first one. The thing that really drew me in, like, for him was... The beats, like, because at the time, it was like 2015, so he was still in his lazy flow stage. And, of course, I, I love that shit. But the thing that really drew me in was the production from, like, Young Good, um, White Armor, fucking Young Sherman, all those dudes. And the visuals, because his visuals had, like, that was, like, the first taste of, like, nostalgia I had, where I knew that I wanted to incorporate some kind of nostalgia into my music. Because he used, like, Pokemon and all this other shit that was just, like, it was, like... It was an unknown nostalgia. Like, I couldn't, like, pinpoint how I related to some of the shit that he was putting in his videos. But, like, I knew it. Like, it's really weird. And that's that That was the first taste of, um, like I said, nostalgia. And, like, I was like, damn, like, this is something that I want to evoke with my music. And then, obviously, with the pop punk, that's the music that I listened to, you know, growing up as a kid and shit. And that's what, you know, I, I, I like I said, I sat down one day. I realized, like... You know, cause it was, it was, I was at a weird point music wise. Like I didn't really know what to do. Um, I didn't know what direction I wanted to go in music, you know, music wise. And I didn't even know if I, it was going to work out. So I sat down, I got really fucking smacked and I was like, what are the things that I really, really like? And it came down to like, you know, the young lean cloud rap kind of shit, pop punk metal and all that. And I was like, all right, so these are the things that I really care about. I don't, I've always liked, you know, you get interest and you, you get interested in things for like, a couple months. That's that's how I am sometimes. We're like, I'll I'll pick something up, you know, maybe a new genre or something. But these genres that I named are the genres that like I always listen to, and they really molded me not only as the person, like you said, but as an artist too. On that day where you really sat down and looked at all of the interests that intrigued you from a musical standpoint, looking back at that now, has the music you made since then pleased you as a person? I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, it it pleases me way more now than it did before. Because I feel like I'm using my influences, you know, in, in, a, in a good way. And I'm reinventing something. I don't know what I'm reinventing, but I'm doing something new. And it, it feels a lot better than what I was doing before, to be honest. Because, like, when I was producing, I would always watch interviews. Like, I'm a big interview person. Like, when I found out about an artist, the first thing I do is look up interviews. Because I like to see, like, how they are as a person, what their influences are. And I was, you know producing hip-hop at the time i wasn't even rapping or doing anything vocally and i would look up you know like producers that i fucked with and i would look up their interviews and i would notice that like their interests or their influences were never like mine like a lot of hip-hop producers their influences come from like jazz or gospel and shit like that and like i didn't listen to it so i was just like damn and, like i felt very lost in that way i was just like you know all these other producers that i look up to and that i really fuck with are influenced by things that I'm not really influenced by and I don't, you know, really have an interest in. So now that I'm using what influenced me and the things that I really fucked with in my music, I feel way better as an artist. Like, I feel like I'm getting my point across better. I feel like I'm expressing myself in a better way than I ever am. And it's, it's like, I, I feel more comfortable making music every single day. Like, I may not be satisfied all the time. I might make songs that I throw away or whatever, but like, as a whole, I, I feel much better making music. And I feel like I'm just ready to keep, you know, improving and keep innovating and switching shit up all the time. Well, I think, too, the response that you just gave really, you know, went the opposite route that you took on a song in particular on I Gave the World My Heart and All I Have For It Are Scars and Nightmares, where you say that you we live our lives trying to please others, but we can never please ourselves. And it seems like through the DM that you just received, I mean, unfortunately, you weren't able to please someone else's musical taste but more importantly at the end of the day you pleased yours you got a point there that's something that i i you know kind of realized is that uh i'm making this because i like it and i shouldn't i shouldn't be so down on myself because i noticed that when i'm more confident 
when I'm releasing something and I'm like, all right, I really, really fuck with this, it does more. Like with that song, I, I fucked with it hard, but I thought that people weren't going to fuck with it. I thought that nobody was going to like, uh, I gave the world my heart out. I thought people were going to be like, why are you fucking screaming? You know, what is this? Because I've, I've gotten that before. People cut the screen parts out of my songs like all the time and it's kind of annoying, but it actually did way better than I thought. So I, I you know, lately, the, the past couple of days, I've been just trying to, you know, be more confident in my music and realize that I'm making this because I like it and I shouldn't second guess myself because if I didn't like it, I wouldn't be making it. So I, I kind of was letting the outside world affect me a little bit, maybe in a negative way, but I realize that now I just got to focus on positivity. Exactly, man. And I guess I'm a little bit surprised by the positivity that you're really displaying right now in that it goes against a lot of what you tweeted recently, which included a tweet that said, I felt so empty inside. And the one thing that always seems to fill that void, which is music, is seems to stop filling it. Yeah, see, that's a that's a perfect example of how I'm a, a little bit unstable because I'm kind of different every day. Like I, I wake up and like, I'll know how I'm going to be as soon as I wake up. Some days I feel pretty good. Like Usually if I go outside and I walk around, you know, smoke a little bit, just listen to music, like I feel really good. I like being outside in stores and shit, like being out in like nature by the trees and shit. I feel more comfortable. I feel more open. When I'm inside, I kind of feel like cramped up and just like more anxious. So, Dude, first of all, I feel like I could call you on any day and get a good conversation from you. But what do you, I mean, credit, you've mentioned anxiety before, but what do you really credit has caused you to feel so empty at times. Definitely like the bullying that I got bullied a lot when I was a kid just for being that, you know, the fucking emo kid, whatever. And that's something that didn't really affect me until later on. But also I've had a real bad experience that kind of set off the majority of my anxiety and like my, my panic attacks and things like that. So I was 15. I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, I had open lunch at my high school. What that meant is I smoked and I went back to class fucking high as shit. So it was a normal day. My friend hits me up. He's like, yo, you want to smoke? I was like, obviously, duh, what the fuck? So we go, we go to smoke. And I noticed immediately as soon as he lit it that it smelled weird. But I wasn't like a big pothead at the time. I kind of just did it occasionally. At that time, I wasn't buying weed for myself. I was just like, if somebody hit me up and they're like, yo, you want to throw five and just smoke together? Then yeah. So I did that. We go, kind of smelled like incense, red flag. Anybody listening, if you ever... uh are about to smoke with somebody and it's already rolled and they burn it and it smells like incense don't fucking hit it walk away because it's not weed it's synthetic so i take a hit of it and it like it's like a shotgun to the chest like it just like i couldn't breathe couldn't talk my throat was on fire but he was like no just hit it it's just some loud like you're good da, 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 da. so i keep hitting it my dumb ass and i start walking back to class and i notice that i'm starting to feel real fucked up not just high but like fucked up like i was it was almost like i was seeing life in frames like I, it was like doop 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 I, everything was just in slow motion and i'm walking to class and i'm just feeling instant anxiety like i feel my heart pounding I, i'm sweating I, i'm breathing fast and i'm in the, the middle of the hallway and my friend just kind of abandons me quote unquote friend he's a fucking prick quote unquote friend leaves me laughs at me just like oh like, you're really high like whatever i'm going to class wouldn't help me in my class because I had like a testing, um, state testing. And I saw my other friend. I was about to have a panic attack in the hallway and like start crying and shit. But I saw him. I ran up to him. I'm like, dude, like I'm really fucked up. I don't know what's going on. He's just like, you know, trying to calm me down. He brought me to my class. Things were Gucci, as I thought. But th things weren't really Gucci at all. I go to the computer. I sit down, start taking the test. I can't read anything on the screen. I read it for like two seconds. Like I read like a sentence and immediately I forget what I read. And this kept happening. It kept happening probably like 20 or 30 times until I just gave up. And I was like, nah, fuck this shit. Like obviously it's not working. So I fucking put A for every answer, finished the test in like three minutes. My teacher's like, um, are you sure? Like you, you came in late and you finished the test in three, like three minutes. Are you, are you sure? I was like, yes, I'm sure. And he was like, all right, well. Just, you know, sit tight till the period ends. So I'm sitting and I'm losing my fucking mind. Like I'm sweating through my shirt. I had a gray shirt on. I remember this day perfectly. I had a gray shirt on. I had pit stains like down in my ribs. Like I was sweating so bad. It was terrible. I fucking asked to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. I kind of felt better like outside of the classroom. But as soon as I got in, I felt like shit instantly again. And the period ends. I go to my next class. And I don't, anybody who smoked weed has, you know, you definitely know that. 
you feel like everybody's looking at you if you're in public. But in this case, literally everybody in that classroom was staring at me dead in the face. Well, behind my head because I was in the front of the class. But I turned around, everybody's staring at me. This one kid, he's just like, are you okay? I was like, what do you mean? He was like, you look really sick. Like, you look like gray, pale, gray, don't look so good. As soon as he said that, I threw up all over the place. Like nonstop projectile vomiting. And it was awful. I almost fell over. Like I almost like kind of slumped over. My teacher grabs me. He's just like, are you okay? Like, what happened? I was like, I think I might have eaten some bad food from the corner store. Because that happens. Shit was nasty. The nurses come. And I'm still throwing up in the hallway. I'm just kind of slumped over, like, against the wall. Get me in the wheelchair. And they have to keep stopping in the hallway to let me throw up whatever is left. Because I'm getting motion sickness. So I keep throwing up, like, endless until it's just like I'm dry heaving. And that was by the time I got to the office. And I'm just kind of sitting there, you know, waiting for my mom to come pick me up. And the worst thing they really could have done was to send me home. Because being left alone in that kind of state of mind was very dangerous. Um, I got home. I'm laying down. I can't even look at my phone. I'm kind of just like in a, in a ball, just like laid down in my bed. And, you know, my fucking pillow over my face, like trying to get away from all the light. Because I'm like very sensitive to light at this point. And I was just thinking and thinking and thinking and overthinking and overthinking until I came up with the conclusion that I died and that I was living in hell. And I've had bad experiences with weed before this, but this wasn't weed. It was it was like K2, but like the definition of K2 changes every couple of weeks because it gets banned. So I really don't know what it was, but I'm just kind of putting it under synthetic weed K2. That's what, that's what I got out of it. So I, I thought that everything was going to be okay. I was like, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to be good. I woke up the next day. I was not good. <laughs> I was not good. Like I, I'd never really recovered from it i kind of have always just like i almost kind of learned to live with it like live with the thoughts that i have in my head and i think that that like i said that that could be a reason why i decided to just go all in with music because i literally came down to the idea that nothing really mattered so if i'm going to do anything i'm going to do what i want and that's when i really started taking music seriously it was after that so it could have been a blessing in disguise maybe i have no idea but it's fucked up either way Dude, I definitely think it's a blessing in disguise because one of my favorite tweets from you is that we make mistakes. It's part of life. Don't let it rip you up inside. One day it will all make sense. So the mistake that you made in this situation, unfortunately, is that you smoked the wrong thing. But in the end, it made you realize that it was time to go all in with this music shit. Yep, I agree. That's one of the lyrics from um, from a song on uh, Occam's Razor. So that's that's what I was talking about where I got like, you know, way more personal, way deeper than I've ever gotten before. And that's one of the lyrics that I, I'm really proud of because I feel like it can offer hope to some people who are, you know, going through some shit. So, I mean, going off that too, we'll just dive right into Occam's Razor, man. Dropping on Halloween, man. The definition of Occam's Razor is that it's a problem-solving principle from William of Occam that states among competing hypotheses, the one with the fewest assumptions should be selected. So what hypothesis are you trying to reveal to the world with this release? My hypothesis is that, well, the, the, the definition, as you said, it was, you know, basically, in, in simpler terms, if you have a, a problem and you don't know the solution to the problem, you know, you're overthinking things, typically the, the most simple solution is the solution. And it's one of the things that I kind of, I realized as I was like researching philosophy and shit, like during the making of the EP, I didn't even know I was going to have an EP. I was just like stacking songs up. I knew like a general mood that I wanted to go for, so I went for it. I didn't know what it was called or anything. I came across that and I was like, instantly, boom, because that's what I did for the EP. Like that's where the idea of the EP really came from. Was I was just like, I need to just do, speak my mind in the purest way possible. No filter, no nothing. I want to get the realest and deepest I can on this project, and that's how that came about. So I guess the uh, the hypothesis is that. You can do whatever you want, but if you're overthinking things, take the simplest route, and I think it'll things will work out for you. What previous situations in life do you wish that you would have realized to take the simplest route? I think like a lot of my life, I really wish I would have known about this because I've been in a lot of situations where due to my anxiety, I've made some poor choices simply because I was overthinking things, and even like it really helped with my anxiety 
really any situation, any negative situation I've been in, I, I wish I would have known about this. The simplest solution in any situation is to blame our dude, Matt Skiba. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely, dude. Fuck Matt Skiba, bro. <laughs> I can't say it enough, man. Your dislike toward Matt Skiba is hilarious. I got no real beef with him. I mean, I do have beef with him. Don't get me wrong. I don't hate him. I think he's probably a cool guy. He's probably a nice guy, but I don't think he has a place in Blink. It's like, okay, let's say you're like, you know, this is a situation that might people might be able to relate to. Let's say like your parents are together for your whole life. All of a sudden, they break up. You know, a step parent comes in. You're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to be like, what the fuck is going on here? That's exactly how I feel. Dude, that's the best way to put it, man. That was put in a very relatable sense of manner. Yeah, because I grew up with Blink, man. Like, they were my favorite band. So I had this fucking new guy just come in. And you think I'm just going to accept it? No, what the fuck? It's Matt, bro, Tom DeLong forever. I don't give a fuck. It's always going to be fuck Matt Skiba until he leaves eventually, because I feel like he will. <laughs> Maybe that's just wishful thinking. I don't know. Dude, I think he will too, man. Like I told you a while back, I saw him, I saw Blink about last month, and like it just wasn't the same without Tom. But it was really funny, because people thought Tom was going to show up and got hissed when he didn't. And it's like, if you follow the band, you're, you would realize that Tom hasn't been part of Blink for like two years. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't get that. People are kind of dumb. But like, yeah, because, I mean, he said something in an interview, like, kind of recently. It was, it was within the past year where Tom said that, you know, he was like, if I if I wanted to join Blink again, I, I could. Like, I have the power to. So I'm hoping that maybe he comes to his senses. I, like, the thing is, is I don't think that, like, California was that bad of an album. I don't really fuck with it. I think that it, it lost a lot of its, like, it's... How do I explain it? Like, it's rawness. Like, it's too clean. Like, the production is so clean on it. And, like... It's cool and all. Like I, I like clean mixing, but like there's a there's a middle ground where I feel like a lot of people have to come to when it comes to mixing, especially live band shit, because there it gets to a point where if you make it too clean, that shit is gonna sound robotic. It's not gonna sound real. So you gotta kind of hit a middle ground between the rawness of playing actual instruments and you know the clarity of having a professional mix down and you know having everything done with the computer. I think if we apply Occam's razor in this situation, if Tom wouldn't be able to come back to the band is to simply have Shinigami take Skiba's place. Dude, I would fucking do it. I would quit Shinigami. Everything that has to do with Shinigami, I would erase. I would delete my SoundCloud if they were like, all right, you could join the band. <laughs> all it takes Focus. is for them to hear the Damn It cover because, I mean, I've told you this before too. That cover is just as good, I might say, if not better than the original. Oh, damn, man. You, you, you touched my heart on that one. I really appreciate that. Seriously. But I, I don't think it's as good as the original. I think it kind of sucks. But, you know, got to give the people what they want. <laughs> Why do you think it sucks? I don't know. I feel like I'm, I don't have the as raw as a voice as, as Mark did. But there's a reason for that. Fucking, um, I saw an interview because, like I said, I, I look up interviews and all that shit all the time when, it come, when I find out about artists. So I came across this a while ago. When Mark was recording Damn It, it was like out of his range and that's why it's a lot more like harsh and like the vocals are more harsh and more like yelly than most blink songs and like he said that you know it was out of his range he had to re-record it and like he fucked up his voice like multiple times and that was just like the best you know recording that they had of it so for me like it wasn't as hard like i, I kind of have like a little bit of a higher range than him so i feel like i maybe don't sound as raw as he does but i tried to i tried to you know add my a little bit of grit a little bit more grit to my voice try to do it but i don't think i'll ever be able to touch the original so do you think it was the lack of raw voice that made the people in the no jumper chat room roast on you so much man oh yeah definitely they were fucking cooking <laughs> They were cooking me. They're like, oh, this kid sounds so gay. This shit is so whack. Like, this is so soft. This is fucking, I think they said, like, Drake for white people. And I was just like, okay. What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's a favorite. Drake for white people. Or Owl City, obviously. <laughs> Dude, because when, um, whenever I get uploaded to, like, fucking Astari, shout out Astari. But every time I get uploaded on there, I get, like, a plethora of hate. And it's like the funniest shit. It's, it's saddening that you get hate because it's not deserved, but you handle it extremely, extremely well and professional. Oh, yeah. I don't give a fuck about that shit. That shit is just kind of funny to me. Like, I get the only reason like I'll, I'll get any kind of anger is because I'm like, why are you wasting your time? Like, this is I see it as a human being. Why is this human being that literally can do anything they want? Why are they wasting time? Sitting on the Internet and just bitching like I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I bitch about my life on Twitter, but. I'm doing something, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, so like, and I'm not directing my, my, my bitching towards anybody usually. So to see people that li like literally you could do whatever you want 
and you choose to sit on the internet and bitch at somebody that did nothing wrong to you. I think that's kind of fucked up. It kind of makes me mad and sad at the same time. Dude, you have a right to be extremely sad in that situation. But if you can ignore the hate so well, why do you still want the Korean missile to land right in your asshole? Because life is ups and downs, man. <laughs> Sometimes you just want a nuclear fucking warhead in your ass. That's how it is. <laughs> Sometimes I just wake up and I'm like, damn, I really wish I get, could get rammed with a fucking nuclear warhead like right about now. But sometimes I wake up and I'm like, damn, life is beautiful. It's time to go out and smell the flowers as I am right now. <laughs> I can't I, I completely agree. It's ups and downs on a daily basis. But I can't get over the fact that if anyone has an addiction to putting things in other people's assholes, it's Shinigami. Oh yeah. Definitely. You know what the fuck is going on. <laughs> Dude, my favorite thing when I recorded with Lil Lotus was trying to figure out who on his Curious Cat made the comment that they want to take Zans out of his asshole, <laughs> and we finally concluded that it was the one and only Shinigami. Yeah, you know what the fuck is going on? I I, I be I be clowning on my friends in their in their uh, Curious Cat. Whenever I see them, like, oh, you know, ask me questions, I'll go directly and just say the most fucked up thing I could think of in that very moment in time, or the nastiest thing. But, like I try because there's like. You can say dumb shit, and then they might ignore it, but you have to, like, give a genuine question. So I asked the Lotus, like, can I eat a Zan, or can you eat a Zan out of my ass? You know? That was a, <laughs> that's what I thought of at that moment in time. Don't ask me why. <laughs> my man, I'm just really glad that in this upcoming project in Occam's Razor that, I mean, you're obviously able to, you know, be more vulnerable. And, I mean, how does that feel to you know touch on topics that no one else really knows about regarding you how does it feel to get that off your chest all right so there, there's two parts to this i feel really good like overall like, i feel great like i feel like now i can move on i got this out of the way i, I got real personal because it's something that i've kind of I got, i've gotten personal songs before but not as personal as i have on you know some of the songs on this and i feel great because now I can kind of move on. I almost feel like I had like, you know, ghosts in my head and I got rid of the ghosts. They're not haunting me anymore. And I kind of just release them. Because when you release, when you say something that you know that people are going to listen to and going to dissect or whatever, you know, especially if it's personal, it can be weird. But it's also very therapeutic. So I feel good. But at the same time, it's like I know that because I am getting more attention now, like my family, like my parents and shit might hear what I'm saying, you know, that's always like a weird thing, like, uh, I don't know, it's kind of fucked up, my parents were asking me about this podcast, they're like, oh, you know, where's it gonna be, like, and I was just kind of ducking it, because I don't want them to listen to it, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want them to hear me and be like, damn, like, my son is fucking wild, like, what is wrong with him, like, <laughs> especially, like, like, you know, my, like, family, family, like, my aunts, uncles, and all that shit, they would definitely have a bone to pick with me if they heard what I was saying in some of my songs, <laughs> dude, I first of all, I don't let my parents listen to the podcast. And then a week ago, my grandma gave me feedback, and she's like, "Andy, I love what you're doing. You just <laughs> you, you got to stop cussing." And it's like, Grandma, unfortunately, you're not the the average listener of back to back hip hop. So I understand that that nerve wracking situation with your parents. Oh yeah, dude, that shit. I mean, like it's happened. Like they've heard my songs before, and like it's a it's a very disgusting i guess in my household you know are you okay like do you want to talk to somebody and it's just like no like i understand that what you're hearing like i, I understand their point of view like i'm not ignorant i'm not like oh like, my parents don't understand me like i get i'm their son and they don't want me to like feel sad or anything like that but the thing is is that like because of music my anxiety and you know all the negative things that i deal with they don't affect my day-to-day -day life as much as they used to because i'm able to release those emotions with music so what they might be hearing might be alarming but it's things that if it weren't for the music i might have done like i might have you know committed suicide if it wasn't for music because i at one point i was just feeling so lost and it was not anybody else's fault like that's one thing that i stress a lot that like it's not i don't blame anybody but myself you know, I'm the reason why I feel this way. And that's, that's why I'm so willing to, you know, try to get better because I know that it is in my power. So I try to explain to them, you know, if they're listening to it, you know, take it with a grain of salt. It's, it's me, but it's also the reason why I feel better. And like, you don't, they, they didn't notice that I was feeling, you know, these, these things. Cause like, I'm able to get up every day 
and kind of just, you know, you know, live my life without being as negatively affected as I was before. You've told me that this project in particular is going to make listeners have a different outlook on you as a person. How so? I feel like they'll definitely know me more as a person and like understand the roots of why, you know, I make this music, the roots of why I feel the way that I do. And I feel like that people who may feel like they are voiceless, may feel like they have nobody, I feel like I can offer help to them. And that's what I really want to do is like I want, because I know there's a lot of people out there that feel the way that I feel and have felt things that I felt and they feel so lost. And one of the only things that ever helped me through anything was music. So the only thing that I can do is kind of repay that and try to offer my help to, you know, anybody, everybody. I think that my music is, is pretty accessible. Like I think that anybody can listen to it and and get something out of it. You know, like I, I try really hard to, to do that. And like, I feel like after this is released, I feel like a lot of the uh, hype beasts, I guess you could say, the people who just want lullaby trap and all that shit, I feel like, like it'll kind of change their mind and be a little bit more accepting to my music. So I feel like, like I said, like that person that fucking DM me, they only want the fucking lullaby trap. They don't want to hear anything else except for, except for that. But I feel like and, I, and I'm not like dissing on my fans or anything because my my real supporters and shit they like fuck with anything I make and that's why I fuck with them so hard. But there's a lot of like you know the hype beasts that only want to hear one thing, and I feel like this might either drive them away or you know make them realize, all right, you know I kind of fuck with the other things that he makes and make them a little bit more open minded as people. One, well, what I think you know those certain fans might not realize is that once again, I mean, you're letting your heart guide the way. And you're doing that by first and foremost just being vulnerable with everybody about yourself. Yeah, definitely. I feel like that's something that maybe not a lot of people understand, especially if, like, they don't know an artist that well. Because, like, all right, I'm not going to lie. Like, if you listen to a couple of my songs, like, like some one-off songs, like, you can have a complete, like, it's there. Like, if you listen to, somebody's never heard of me before, and then listen to, like, Sea Salt Ice Cream, they're going to have a very different opinion on me than somebody who knows all of my music. Because they're going to think that I'm this, like, you know, this light-hearted, bubblegum fucking pop kid that's making these fucking cute-ass songs. And, like, yeah, I've made some cute music, but, like, I, I like to do, like, explore all emotions. So, yeah, some people just weren't art, you know, I, I get it, because I've been like that before, where I've listened to an artist, and I only listen to, like, one song of their discography. So I'm not going to be, like, a hypocrite and be like, oh, I don't understand. Because, like, I get it, but, like, if you really fuck with an artist as a person, and as an artist, not just because you fuck with this one song, then you'll be more accepting to them changing or exploring new sounds or experiments. Absolutely, and I feel like, too, obviously, with each project, you're exploring more and more into what you want musically, but more importantly, you're simply just learning more about yourself as an individual. Yeah, definitely. I feel like every every release of mine is a little bit more me. And um, like before, like when I first started singing and shit, I was awful. Like I'm not gonna, I, I don't lie about this shit. I don't like, you know, try to fucking put on this facade. Like I use pitch correction, I use auto tune and shit. But recently, I have been getting a lot better and. The majority of the songs on Occam's Razor, there was either minimal pitch correction just to clean things up or none at all. Uh, there's some songs that are obviously like super auto-tuned, and that's like a little bit interesting because you, you hear me say auto-tuned, but it's on a song that you wouldn't expect to be auto-tuned at all. It was just kind of like a, an artistic thing. But um, yeah, so I feel like every release, I'm getting more comfortable with my voice, and I'm less like all right, I can just fix this in pitch correction, post-processing. I'm kind of more like, let me get it fucking right. Let me make sure I do this right. Like, you know, I get more comfortable hearing my own voice raw and unedited, which is something that I struggled with before. I was just like, oh, like I'm fucking a terrible singer. And it's that affected me negatively a lot because I didn't have as much confidence to maybe try to broaden my range and like sing higher. And it's like, I, I'm, like oh, I'm gonna sound fucking terrible. I'm like, you're gonna sound bad at first, but if you practice a couple of times, you can gain control pretty easily. And that's something that, like, I've learned. And, and also, like, general musicianship, because, like, I mean, I'm doing shit on computer, but, like, I originally bought, a, like, a new guitar, like, my first electric guitar. And, like, I've never felt more free making music. Like, I've never felt more comfortable because, like, doing the, the live band shit is fun. But, like, when you're doing it through a plug-in, it's kind of weird. Like, it's just like, oh, like, the computer's doing it. But, like, I recorded already, like, two or three songs with the guitar, and it's just, like, it feels so good. Like, I feel like there's nothing I can't do. 
right now, music-wise. And with singing in particular, didn't it take almost over two years for you just to get comfortable enough with your voice to even try singing in the first place? Yeah, yeah, because um, basically like how I decided to sing was at the time, it was like 2015, I first discovered Young Lean and like Bones, and I was just kind of introduced to the underground shit, you know? And I came across Nothing Nowhere when Nothing Nowhere had like, I don't even know. He had maybe a couple thousand followers. Not that much. Don't mind me, which is the second or third song that he dropped. And it blew my fucking mind. Ever since that day, I wanted to sing, but I never did because I was scared. And I wasn't like, at the time, when I came across these genres, I was still making EDM because I made EDM and shit. Um, I made like dubstep and fucking all that cringy shit <laughs> for at first. But like I said, I always wanted to sing. And then like a year ago, my buddy Brandon Kaizen, shout out Kaizen, he uh, sent me this instrumental and he was like, yo, you want to do something on this? And it had like a cute lullaby kind of melody and it was like a trap beat. So I recorded the first like two bar, two or three bars off of um, Ghost. So I recorded it. I sent it over to him. I was like, what do you think of this? I kind of just came up with this idea in my head. I don't really know how to feel about it. And he was just like, dude, this is fucking fire. Like finish it and we'll see what's going on. So I tried to finish it. But I tried to finish it too fast. Like I, I rushed it and I didn't like it. Um, he didn't really like it that much, like the, the rest of it. And he was just kind of like, you know, iffy about the song. And um, he ended up like wanting to use the instrumental for like an EP or something. So like two weeks went by, the song was like in purgatory. Like I wasn't really thinking about it that much. I kind of forgot about it almost. And then like this one day I was just like, I don't want this idea to go to waste. Like I feel like it, it could definitely be something. Because the people that I showed really fucked with it. And I was just like, you know, like, it kind of gave me the confidence to like redo it a little bit better, record it better, make better melodies, make better lyrics. So I did it. I made the, I remade a different instrumental with a different melody. And I finished the verse. And I went to school. It was like my first or second day of school. I showed my friends and they were like, what the fuck? Like, drop this shit right now. Like, I've never even heard anything like this before. I was like, really? Like. I didn't think it was that cool. I thought it was, you know, something new and, like, interesting, but I didn't think it was that cool. And they were just like, nah, dude, just drop it. Everybody, like, you know, I was showing it to was just like, drop it. So I went home that day. I dropped the fucking song. I had, like, 2,000 followers. This was a year ago. So it, I had, like, around 2,000, 2,500 maybe. So I woke up the next day and I had 3K. And I was like, fuck, like, that's so sick. And ever since then, it, it just, you, you know, if you've, been here since ghost you've seen it you know everything that's happened up until this point i mean i just you know continue to grow and shit and like improve on my voice like if you listen to ghost i couldn't i probably i have never played that song live i've done two shows and i haven't played it live because it's at such a low register that i would feel so weird singing it live because i'm used to singing higher now so like i mean I, i'm definitely gonna have to do it one day but i have to figure out you know how it's going to be a little more comfortable on my end. Dude, once again, though, it all comes down to following your heart because, I mean, from the get-go, you wanted to sing, felt that two years in wasn't necessarily still the right time, finally made it happen, and here we are. Yeah, basically that's it. I just listen to my heart. Let my heart be my guiding key. So you've talked about how each new project you release reveals a deeper layer of who you are. I know after Occam Razor's release, you're planning on making a project that's a sequel to Luna. How is this project going to further reveal who you really are as a person? All right, so this, this is a big one. This is going to be a big reveal. Everybody needs to listen to this fucking interview because I'm not going to say it anywhere else. We've got the exclusive rundown. Basically, the idea for Luna was almost to create a soundtrack, like a soundtrack to an anime or a movie or a game. I wanted it to be very, like, not cinematic, but like I wanted it to be tell kind of a story, and I wanted the music and the melodies to convey different emotions and, you know, different, like, parts of a story. And I feel like I really didn't do that well with Luna. You know, everybody has their own opinions, but listening back, I definitely could have done it better. But that's why I wanted to get the whole, the personal shit out of the way, because now I feel like I can write about anything. And my idea for the sequel to Luna is that it's going to be like a concept album, but it's not just going to be like, if, if you, Occam's Razor has 10 songs, so did Luna. But Occam's Razor is an EP because I kind of just had a bunch of songs laying around that were kind of a similar vibe, you know, and they had a, 
a personal meaning to me, but I wouldn't call it an album. This album is going to have like 20 songs and I'm trying to make it way more like cinematic and like over the top and emotional and beautiful. And it's going to be a lot more soundtrack ish than Occam's Razor. It's more like Luna, how like Luna's, I don't know though. Cause when I was making it, I was playing hella kingdom hearts, hella final fantasy. I was watching like watching anime and shit like that. And like, I wanted to do something that kind of evoked those emotions so I want to take that idea and just basically put it on steroids and make it 10 times better, 10 times harder, well, more well-produced, more variation. But, like, I want it – like, the entirety of the album is going to have a story. Like, I'm going to write a story. Like, it's going to be a short story. Like, it's not going to be anything crazy. It's going to be, like, a page, like more like an outline than anything. But I'm going to explore, you know, what happens within this story – in the album and i'm gonna like i don't know i feel like it's 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 gonna be ridiculous and i'm already excited and i'm already ready for it and i'm sure the fans are ready for it too but because i think that you know like i said i needed to get this real personal shit out of the way so that i can move on and just get way better way more creative do way crazier shit so that's basically it dude that sounds incredibly incredibly dope damn i really appreciate that man i thought a lot of people would think that shit was corny a lot of some people don't like concept albums for some reason. <laughs> Dude, that could be a whole nother podcast. Oh yeah, of course. That could be a whole nother podcast as well as your love of clout. Oh yeah, dude. I fucking I ooze clout, bro. I walk down the street and people are just like running after me trying to get some clout. I have to like smack them. Well, I hope you realize that you have an infinite amount of clout alone solely because of the fact that that you photoshopped your head and put it on Mark Hoppus's body for the damn it cover art. Yeah, yeah, dude, I had to fucking do it. I was I was super bored. I didn't have a cover for the song. And I was like, all right, what can I do that's funny? And I was like, all right, I'm going to photoshop myself over Mark Hoppus in this picture because I had the picture saved on my computer for a while for some reason. I think, uh, you know, Blink, they're very attractive dudes, so I just like looking at them. But I was like, honestly, I think I think Blink might be better with me in it. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, next year at this time, Shinigami is going to be the third member of Blink-182. All right, this is honestly a stretch, but if, if I if I had a choice, if I was able to join Blink, I, would, I wouldn't quit Shinigami. That, that was a little bit, little bit uh, excessive. I wouldn't quit being Shinigami, but <laughs> the only way that I would do it is if that Mark Hoppus left and Tom rejoined, then it was me and Tom. <laughs> All right, fair enough. I'm Team Tom as well, so I can't argue that. I love Mark. Don't get me wrong, but like, imagine Shinigami and fucking Tom DeLonge on a song, like a, on a pop punk song. But honestly, that is like my main goal. Like I fuck with Mark Hoppus, so either one of them, my goal is to get a feature from from one of them, or both. Not on the same song. I don't think they'd be down for that. But two songs. One is featuring Mark Hoppus, and one is featuring fucking Tom DeLonge, and they're both gonna be pop punk songs. Dude, Shinigami is going to be the reason why Blink-182 is reunited. Dude, I got to do what I got to do. Imagine that. They just say, yeah, like, you know, we're getting back together. And, you know, we really have to thank uh, Shinigami for bringing us together. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fucking ridiculous. Dude, the, the one person who would obviously hate you would be our boy, Mr. Skiba. Oh, yeah, he would fucking despise me. He'd probably try to, like, put a hit out on me. Like, this guy ruined my life. My friends don't like me anymore. I got kicked out of the band. <laughs> Dude, I take it he wouldn't want to eat Zans out of out of your ass. Oh, definitely not. <laughs> Shinny, dude, you are my boy, man. I was so, so hyped to get you on the podcast when we finally got it done, man. I appreciate you big time. Dude, I appreciate you too. I, this is this was a great experience. I'm really happy. I'm really happy that my first real interview could be through you because I really fuck with your podcast. Follow Shinigami on Twitter at I Hate Shinigami. Check him out on SoundCloud. Be on the lookout for Occam's Razor dropping on Halloween. Follow Nick and I on SoundCloud, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Back to Back Hip Hop. Thank you so much for listening. Peace out.